Sunday morning. We hope the weather stays this way for the rest of the day. Stuart Nixon is with us once again to lead us in a discussion on biblical scholarship. What is it? Is it relevant? And is it relevant to the people of faith? So we're looking forward to that discussion. Please remember that following the installation, I mean, following the worship service today at 10 o'clock, at right at 11, we'll have the installation of our new officers, deacons and elders, and uh, Brick will type in a Zoom link into the YouTube chat during the service, so the, the link will not be on the chat uh, on the Sunday school class here, but it'll be in the link on the uh, worship service, so Please join the installation of our officers. That's a, it will be live and it will be at 11 o'clock immediately following the worship service. Uh, also, please remember to refer to the FP Seasons pamphlet um, for this summer's activities at the church. It's very helpful, uh, straightforward, and um, publication. So uh, please refer to it as well as you'll receive communication from the church as to the activities at the church over the summer. And I didn't realize this until yesterday, but today is the last Sunday school class of the 2020-2021 season. And we have conducted 29 classes via Zoom. And we want to thank all of you who have participated via Zoom and staying engaged, uh, given we couldn't get together in person. But uh, we are very fortunate to have the power of technology with us this day and age. In order to stay engaged, be able to connect with each other and hear the uh, discussions and messages that our uh, great teachers have brought to us over this time. So I'd like to give a special thanks to Wilson Kennedy, who is not here with us. He's on vacation for the next two weeks, but he and Mary D. Ellison have been instrumental in getting us set up on doing Zoom. So let's give Mary D. and Wilson a round of applause for that. Mary D., really got us started early on with setting up the tips and tricks for Zoom and helping everybody get uh, comfortable with it. So Mary D, thank you so much for all you did leading up to this and what you've done throughout the year in our uh, classes and monitoring the chats and questions. So uh, please remember to keep those on the special concerns list in your thoughts and prayers and those in the military. And if you have a question today, during Stuart's discussion, please either just raise your hand or type your question or comment into the chat function and we will acknowledge you. And with that, Stuart, I'll turn it over to you and thanks so much for being with us and thanks very much for going to the church to bring us this discussion. Really appreciate it, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, my goodness. Once again, it's gratifying to see so many of you tuning in today because we've certainly <laughs> We're closing out covenant class on a very unusual note where the technology is not uh, doing what we had hoped. As you remember, my original intent was to stop talking after the first session and introduce you to the scholars themselves, both last week and today. Um, with that in mind, I had picked originally two scholars per Sunday, two last week and two today, so you've got a real variety of scholarship. Um, but of course, we can't do that because I, some of the people I had picked uh, depended on, on uh, visual material uh, in their presentation. And that doesn't, doesn't work for us under the current circumstances. So last week, I had to pick somebody that you could listen to and still find uh, useful and helpful um, without seeing that person. And now today I've had to do the same thing. Happily, we have a lot of very good scholars to choose from. And uh, so this was not too difficult to find somebody for today. Um, the person I picked today is uh, Jody Magnus, M-A-G-N-U-S, excuse me, M-A-G-N-E-S-S, -S, Jody Magnus. Uh, 
from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, that de particular department, their Department of Religious Studies, uh, happens to be very, very active in the field of biblical studies. Uh, there are any number of scholars uh, who teach there that I could have picked from. Uh, I picked Jody because she is an archaeologist. That's how she's best known uh, as an archaeologist. She spent a lot of time out in the field uh, ex doing excavations in the Holy Land. Today, I'm going to actually let you hear her teach a class, um, not on archaeology, because that depends so much on pictures, but this is more just her talking. Uh, but you'll understand why I picked this one, because it's all about uh, the historical context of the ministry of Jesus. And I thought you'd like her take uh, on, uh, on a specific subject uh, about this. Now, occasionally in this talk, she will make reference to a term that you might not be familiar with. So what I have done uh, with the help of Brick, thankfully, uh, in the chat function, I have listed these terms. So if you really want to see how they're spelled, uh, you can go into the chat function and you'll see. Uh, I've listed them more or less in chronological order. In other words, as she, as she uses those terms, as she goes through her talk. So um, you can sort of track her uh, if you wish to do it that way. It's a, little, it's a little awkward, I realize, because she's speaking and she's using the term and then she keeps talking. She doesn't stop and wait for you to figure out what she said, obviously. But um, it'll give you a little backup if you, if you want that. So again, I thank you for your uh, coming back out uh, this Sunday uh, to give me some support <laughs> in this, this strange world we live in. But um, I'm, I'm delighted that we have Jody Magnus uh, on tape for you to hear. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll play it as long as we have time. I don't remember how long this talk goes, but uh, you'll get almost all of it. So um, thanks again to Covenant Class. In our last lecture, we talked about the Hasmonean kingdom and the fact that the failure of Alexander Janaeus to properly observe Jewish law aroused the opposition of certain groups in Jewish society. Specifically, we mentioned the Pharisees, and we also referred to the community at Qumran associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. What I'd like to do now is talk about some of these Jewish groups that emerged during the Hasmonean period and specifically in this lecture, focus on what we know about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, first of all, where does our information come from about these groups? Our major sources of information are Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century AD, the books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees, which are apocryphal books, that is, they're included in the Catholic canon of sacred scripture, but not in the Jewish or Protestant canons, the Dead Sea Scrolls from Qumran, the New Testament, and rabbinic literature. So these are our major sources of information about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Josephus, who is a very important source of in information, calls these groups hieresis, which is a Greek word, singular hieresis. The Latin equivalent of the Greek word hieresis would be the Latin secta. Now, automatically, you can see that our word heresy comes from the Greek word hieresis, and you can see that our word sect comes from the Latin word secta. And so when we read Josephus in translation, and we read that he refers to these groups as heresies or sects, it automatically raises certain associations for us today. And the reason is that today, Heresy and sect or sectarian are words that have a negative connotation. Why do these words have a negative connotation today? Because today we refer to groups that do things that are illegitimate or that we disapprove of as sects. And we refer to illegitimate practices or unrecognized practices, which we don't approve of, as heresies. Now, the fact that these words today have negative connotations is actually a very Christian concept. Originally, 
in Greek and in Latin that is in the time of Josephus, hierases, heresy, and secta, sect, had no negative connotations at all. It's only later in the early church that the church fathers begin to use these terms in order to denigrate their opponents. But originally, they were neutral terms. And we can contrast these terms today, heresy, sect, sectarian, with the word denomination. If we refer to a group that we approve of, that is recognized as a legitimate group within, let's say, a larger church, we would refer to that as a denomination. But if we refer to it as a sect or uh, we, refer, we refer to a practice as sectarian or as a heresy, then clearly it's something that we disapprove of. Now I go into this in order to point out that when we read about hierases or about secta in Josephus, we must then remove the modern negative connotations that these words have today and instead understand that they're simply neutral words that in Greek and in Latin referred to schools of thought or philosophical schools or different groups or movements without any of the disapproving connotations that we might read into it from a modern point of view. So what were the major Jewish sects of the Second Temple period, the late Second Temple period, and what do we know about them? First of all, the, when we refer to these groups, we must describe them as groups that separated themselves from other groups, largely because they felt alienated. And they felt alienated because these groups believed that the traditional values had been corrupted. So one of the characteristics then of Jewish sects of the late temple, second temple period of these various groups is that they separated themselves from the rest of Jewish society and believed that the traditional values had been corrupted and they believed that only they were practicing Judaism in the right way. And so one of the characteristics then of these groups of these sects of the late Second Temple period is that each one of them believed that they were doing things the right way and the others were not doing things the right way. Now, Josephus refers specifically to three sects in the late Second Temple period, and he says as follows. Indeed, there exist among the Jews three schools of philosophy, three hierases in Greek. The Pharisees belong to the first, the Sadducees to the second, and to the third belong men who have a reputation for cultivating a particularly saintly life called the Essenes. Now, in this lecture, we're going to be focusing on the first two, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we will talk about the Essenes in the lectures after this. Now, when Josephus says that there are three philosophical schools or three hierases or three of these groups in Judaism in the late Second Temple period, he is undoubtedly simplifying a more complex situation. That is, undoubtedly, there were other groups and movements that existed in late Second Temple period Judea, beginning in the Hasmonean period, but Josephus doesn't mention them. He mentions only Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. Why do I say this? because there is a debate among scholars as to how many different groups existed in late Second Temple period Judaism and what the major groups were. Some scholars think that although there may have been other groups, there were really only three main groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, because these are the ones that we hear of repeatedly in our sources. Whereas other scholars argue that our sources are only partial in terms of the information that they provide, and that there must have been a wide range of groups that existed in Jewish society. And indeed, in some sources, different sources, we get hints of other groups because occasionally other groups are referred to. So there is a question about how complex the picture was, how many different groups and movements and, and sects there were in late Second Temple period Judea. But for our purposes, we're going to focus on the ones that appear to be the major ones, the ones that we have at least the most information on. And those are, for now, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and then later we will also talk about the Essenes. These sects, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, seem to have originated and crystallized by the middle of the second century BC. And in fact, it is the events 
that lead up to the formation of the Hasmonean Kingdom, the outbreak of the revolt against Antiochus IV Epiphanes, culminating with the establishment of the Hasmonean Kingdom that seem to have contributed largely to the formation and crystallization of these groups. And remember that there were some sectors of the Jewish population that opposed some of the practices of the Hasmoneans, including the fact that they served not only as kings, but also as high priests. And these sorts of divisions of opinion apparently contributed to the formation of these different groups, of these different sects. So what do we know then about the Sadducees? Um, the Sadducees are a group that, on the one hand, is well known in the sense that most people have heard of Sadducees. But on the other hand, we have a problem in terms of our information about them. Now, our major sources of information on the Sadducees are all hostile to them. And in fact, our sources of information about the Sadducees are all external sources. That is, we have no sources of information about the Sadducees, Sadducees. that come that from the Sadducees themselves. They come from people or sources that were not part of the Sadducee movement and that were hostile to the Sadducees and so present them in a negative light. And so what are these sources? Josephus talks about the Sadducees and he describes himself as a Pharisee. So he's not a Sadducee, he's a member of another group. The New Testament, which is also hostile to Sadducees. And rabbinic literature, the literature of the later rabbis, which is allied with the Pharisaic movement or grows out of the Pharisaic movement. So in other words, all of our sources of information on the Sadducees are external to the Sadducees and are hostile to the Sadducees and therefore present them in a biased light and generally tend to present the Sadducees in a negative light. Now, what then do we actually know about the Sadducees and about their origins? The Sadducees were a branch of a larger family called the Zadokites. Who exactly were the Zadokites? Way back, centuries before the late Second Temple period, when Solomon had built the first temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, he had appointed a man named Zadok, Hebrew Tzadok, to officiate as high priest in the temple. From that point on, all of the high priests who officiated in the Jerusalem temple traced their ancestry back to Zadok and became known as the Zadokite family. By the second century BC, this Zadokite priestly family was a very extended family. Through a series of kind of complicated events right before the outbreak of the Maccabean Revolt. The Zadokite family lost control of the priesthood in the Jerusalem temple, and the priesthood was taken over, usurped, by other priestly families that were not Zadokites. And from that point on, the Zadokites never again regained control of the priesthood in the Jerusalem temple. Now, this Zadokite priestly family, which at this point is, is very extended, branches off, different branch of, branches of the family go and do different things. One branch of the family, called the Oniads, established a temple at a place in Egypt called Leontopolis. And they and their descendants officiated at this temple in Egypt until it was closed by Vespasian in the year 73 AD. Another branch of the Zadokite family was instrumental in founding and at least initially leading the community that eventually settled at Qumran and deposited the Dead Sea Scrolls in the nearby caves. And yet another branch of this Zadokite family stayed in Jerusalem, accommodated with the ruling powers, and eventually morphed into the group that becomes known as the Sadducees. So in other words, the Sadducees are one branch of the Zadokite family. And in fact, the word Sadducee and Zadokite in Hebrew are basically the same word. And they then become part of the Jerusalem elite in the late first century BC and first century AD.
So who were these people then, these Sadducees of the late Second Temple period? Well, they are therefore members of the elite, which means that they are priestly families by definition and other members of the aristocracy. So although originally the Sadducees are a branch of the Zadokite family, eventually the term comes to refer to the members of the upper class in Judea and especially in Jerusalem in the late Second Temple period. So they're the high priests, they're the aristocracy, and therefore, not surprisingly, both politically and religiously, they were conservatives because they were the elite, they were the upper classes, they had it good. Anybody who has it good is going to want to preserve the status quo and therefore is going to be a conservative. So both politically and religiously, they were conservatives. Now, what does it mean when I say that they were religious conservatives? Political conservatives is clear. They like to keep the status quo, things as they are. But what does it mean religious conservatives? It means that they were opposed to religious innovations. Their opposition to religious innovations, to introducing new things in religious practice, is going to be diametrically opposite to what we will see among the Pharisees. So who are the Pharisees? This is a, another group where it's a little bit difficult to define them at first. The word Pharisee is a word that actually we don't know where it originally comes from. In Hebrew, the Pharisees are the proshim. The name Pharisee in Hebrew therefore comes from a Hebrew word apparently parash, which means to separate. It, actually, we're not positive that that's the root of the name, but it, it likely is. So the word parash, the root of this name Pharisee, means to separate. Well, what does it mean, the separate ones, the ones who separated themselves? Why were they called that? What did they separate themselves from? We don't actually know why they were called that. Did they separate themselves from the Sadducees, from the high priests and the elite? Did they separate themselves from the Hasmoneans, to whom they were largely opposed? Did they separate themselves from the rest of the population, considering the rest of the population to be too lax in their observance of Jewish law? We don't know. All of those are possible. We just don't know for sure. What's interesting is that they didn't actually call themselves Pharisees. They referred to themselves by other names. So when they called each other by a name, they didn't say, hey, over there, you Pharisee. They said, hey, Haver friend, or they would call each other scribes or sages. And sometimes they called each other by the term rabbi. Now, this term rabbi, which is today a loaded term, means something very different from a modern rabbi. When we say modern rabbi today, it's somebody who's undergone a, an official sort of process of ordination and generally leads or officiates in a synagogue. But originally, the term rabbi is a title which literally means my teacher or my master. And it's a title of respect that you would give to somebody who is an authority in Jewish law, who is learned in Jewish law. So they would often call each other by the term rabbi, my master, my teacher. So if the Sadducees were the elite, the sort of upper classes, who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees came from very diverse backgrounds. They came from both rural areas and from urban areas. They included some of the lower ranks of priests, not the high priests, but some of the other kinds of priestly families, craftsmen, small farmers, and merchants. So basically what we have here, and I hate to use this term because it's so anachronistic, but it's what would be analogous to a kind of a middle class or maybe an upper middle class. That is a group that is not among the very poor, but also non, not among the wealthiest classes, but fairly comfortably off. Now, at this point, I want to actually caution and say that I've presented a very sort of black and white picture of Pharisees and Sadducees, but we have to remember that the picture was much more complicated than this. So not necessarily every person who was a high priest or a member of the Jerusalem elite would have considered themselves a Sadducee. 
And not everyone who was from this sort of upper middle class background would have considered themselves a Pharisee. So the picture is more complex than this. But generally speaking, the groups do roughly correspond with these kind of socioeconomic groups. Well, what are the Pharisees known for? One of the major things that they, are, that they are known for is their recognition of oral tradition in addition to written law. And what do I mean there? The core of the Hebrew Bible is the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, or what Jews call the Torah. The five books of Moses contain the laws that the God of Israel gave to his people and which they were expected to live their lives according to. So by definition, if you were a Jew, a Judean, in antiquity, you then worshiped the God of Israel as your national deity, as your patron God, and lived your life according to the laws that he gave his people in those five books of Moses. Fair enough. That's a pretty basic element. So what's new about the Pharisees? In addition to the observance of this written law, the Pharisees added an element of oral tradition. And why is this? The Hebrew Bible, the five books of Moses in particular, had been compiled and edited now centuries before the late Second Temple period. And already by this time, and it's even more the case today, many of those laws applied to situations which no longer existed because times change and there's human progress and technology changes. And so over the course of time, if you want to continue to live your life according to the laws in the five books of Moses, you're going to need to do a certain degree of interpretation and adaptation of those laws in order to make them fit the current situation. To give you a very anachronistic example from today, nowhere in the five books of Moses does it say that you may not flip a light switch on the Jewish Sabbath on, the, on, on Saturday. What the Hebrew Bible says, what the Pentateuch says, is that you may not light a fire on the Sabbath. Well, once electricity was invented, Judaism had a problem. Nowhere in the Bible does it refer to, to electricity. So modern rabbis went back and interpreted the biblical passage that says that you may not light a fire on the Sabbath to refer also to electricity, and thereby Jews who observe Jewish law, biblical law, will not flip a light switch on the Sabbath because that turns on the electricity. So what do the Pharisees do? They develop an oral tradition where these rabbis, that is these men who are learned in Jewish law, study the biblical passages, study the biblical laws, and interpret them, and begin to pass down their interpretations to generations of disciples or students. And this body of oral tradition or oral interpretation becomes sort of the characteristic feature of the Pharisees and distinguishes them from some of the other groups of the late Second Temple period. So let's now take a look at some examples of the differences between these groups as reported by our various sources. Let's see, first of all, what Josephus says here about the Sadducees. He says, but the doctrine of the Sadducees is this, that souls die with the bodies, nor do they regard the observation of anything besides what the law enjoins them. So notice Josephus says that the Sadducees simply will not accept anything except what is written exactly in the law, in the Torah, in the five books of Moses. And as part of this, they believe that souls die with the body, which means that there's no life after death. Why, is, why do they believe that there's no life after death? Because, the Sadducees said, nowhere in the Pentateuch is there an explicit doctrine of the resurrection of the dead after death. So therefore, they, they believe that souls die with the body because there's no reference to anything but that in the Hebrew Bible. Josephus says about the Pharisees, on the other hand, they also believe that souls have an immortal vigor in them and that under the earth there will be rewards or punishments according as they have lived virtuously or viciously in this life. So the Pharisees, according to Josephus, believe exactly the opposite. They developed a tradition that after death there is in fact some sort of an afterlife. And this is diametrically opposed to what the Sadducees believed. And the Sadducees rejected this because there's no explicit doctrine of such in, in the Bible. 
Now, very interesting, we actually see this also reflected in Acts of the Apostles, where it says, for the Sadducees hold that there is no resurrection and that there are no angels or spirits, while the Pharisees believe in all three. So notice that according to Acts also, the Sadducees do not believe in a resurrection, the Pharisees do. And by the way, here it says, the Sadducees also believe that there are no angels or spirits, and the Pharisees believe that there are angels or spirits. Another one of the differences between these groups is the doctrine of free will. To what extent is there human free will? The Sadducees believed in complete human free will. So no intervention at all by God, there's complete human free will. The Pharisees, on the other hand, emphasized both divine omnipotence, God is all-knowing and all-powerful, alongside human freedom and responsibility. And so Josephus says, for example, and when they determine that all things are done by fate, this is the Pharisees, they do not take away the freedom from men of acting as they see fit, since their notion is that it has pleased God to make a temperament whereby what he wills is done, but so that the will of men can act virtuously or viciously. That's actually a little bit confusing. So it's a little hard to understand here what Josephus is saying. We actually have an early rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, who puts it much more simply. This is what the Pharisees believe. All is foreseen, but free will is given. So in other words, people have free will to choose what they're going to do, but because God is all knowing, he knows what you are going to choose to do before you even do it. So this is sort of the Pharisee doctrine, which is that there is human free will, but there's also an element here of God knowing what's going to happen. And when we get to talk about the Essenes, we will see that they actually believe that there was no human free will at all. They believe that everything is preordained by God. So we have three points of a spectrum here. Sadducees at one end believing in complete human free will, Essenes at the other end, no human free will, and the Pharisees somewhere in the middle in this case. Now, with which sect did Jesus usually engage in debate? Um, if you go through the Gospels, you will see that the group that is mentioned over and over again are the Pharisees. And this then, if we take it at its most literal reading, would suggest that Jesus engaged most in debate with the Pharisees. However, this is debated by scholars. Why is it a subject of contention among scholars? Well, the canonical gospels as we have them today were written down pretty much after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Mark, which is the earliest, maybe 60 to 70 AD, but pretty much what we have dates to after 70 AD. Where's the problem? The problem is that these groups apparently disappear or cease to exist after 70. So by the time the gospel accounts are written, these groups pretty much have disappeared. Now I actually have to qualify this a minute and say that in recent years, some scholars have suggested that although we don't hear about these groups after 70, maybe actually they did continue to exist for a while after 70. Um, and so maybe the gospel accounts are not completely anachronistic in that regard. This is a little bit problematic. It's also problematic because we cannot define precisely the relationship between the Pharisees and the rabbis after 70. After 70, the dominant group, the dominant religious authority in Judaism becomes the rabbis. And there's clearly some sort of a relationship between the rabbis after 70 and the Pharisees before 70 because they have a, a same sort of a view of the practice of Jewish law, which is that it's okay to use this body of oral tradition in order to interpret the written law and to practice Judaism. So somehow the rabbis after 70 seem to grow out of the Pharisaic movement before 70. And, and it may be in fact that some of the other movements also continue to exist in some form after 70. So there's, there's a whole problem here with how long these groups continue to exist after 70, in what form they continue to exist. And this is the problem in trying to then relate the groups that we know about with the gospel accounts. So if we take the gospel accounts at face value, it looks like Jesus is usually engaging in debate with the Pharisees. 
So there could be two logical explanations for this. Number one, either Jesus really is continu really does debate the Pharisees more than any other group, and the Gospels are therefore more or less accurate. Or the other possibility is, and this is what some scholars think, that Jesus is portrayed as debating the Pharisees because by the time the Gospels are being written, after 70, the only major group that really is continuing to exist is the Pharisaic movement, which is morphing into the rabbis. Hmm. Well, this is kind of a conundrum, actually. <laughs> uh, there's actually no solution to this question. It's an ongoing debate among scholars. I will actually say that I think that, without saying that the Gospels are completely historically accurate, that to my mind, it's most likely that Jesus really was debating mostly with the Pharisees, because the Sadducees are the upper classes there in Jerusalem, and they wouldn't have been debating with Jesus when he's up in Galilee. And the Essenes, well, they're a marginal group that we'll see that probably wasn't debating with Jesus's movement. So of the movements that we know about, actually, most logically, it would have been the Pharisees who Jesus was engaging in debate with. Well, Okay, anyway, this is what the Gospels portray. Usually Jesus is engaged in debate with the Pharisees. Now let's take a look at an example of a passage where Jesus is engaged in a debate. The Pharisees gathered about him, Jesus, with some scribes, and there's a whole other question, who are these scribes, right? Are they a different group? Are they part of the Pharisaic movement? Are they Sadducees? A whole other question. The Pharisees gathered about him with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem. They had noticed that some of his disciples ate their food without first giving their hands a ceremonial washing to purify them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews observe the rules handed down from their ancestors and will not eat until they have washed their hands in a particular way, and they will not eat anything from the market without first purifying it by sprinkling it. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not observe the rules handed down by our ancestors, but eat food without purifying their hands? And this is what Jesus says to them. He said to them, it was about you hypocrites that Isaiah prophesied so finely in the words, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines, that's a quote from Isaiah, you abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. And this, of course, from Mark. Now, this is actually very interesting. Jesus, of course, is then his response is, you're hypocrites because you observe the law with your lips by words, but not with your hearts. But then he says, he goes on and he says that, you, that they are worshiping God by teaching human precepts as doctrines, and holding to human tradition. What is this reflecting? This is actually very interesting. It is a criticism of the Pharisaic observance of oral tradition versus written law. So what Jesus is saying is your, your criticism of us that we're not washing hands before eating is based on a tradition that has no, no basis in the written law. It is one of your oral traditions. Therefore, it is a human doctrine that has nothing to do with the laws of God. And that's how Jesus responds to the criticism of the Pharisees according to this passage in Mark. So with this, we're going to wrap up our discussion of Pharisees and Sadducees. And we will now continue next time with the community that lived at Qumran and deposited the Dead Sea Scrolls in the nearby caves. All right. Well, um, a lot of context there, a lot of uh, terms that maybe you haven't heard before. Some of them I hadn't heard before either, for that matter. Um, I can sketch in a little bit of background that might, might help you with that. We have just a few minutes. She started the lecture, as, as you noticed, with a reference to the Hasmoneans, or, uh, or their nickname is the Maccabees. If you remember our talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Hasmoneans were all Jewish people who successfully revolted against uh, foreign overlords, the Syrians, as it, as it were, and achieved a state of independence for the Jewish people. Now, this was in the second century BC, the 100s. Um, and it was quite a feat. 
because the Hasmoneans were uh, a small group. They were what you might, might call grassroots and they succeeded uh, in breaking free of the Syrians um, with, the, with their military might and took over Jerusalem, cleansed the temple, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was a big deal and, and is remembered today even among Jews with the uh, practice of Hanukkah, which is the cleansing of the temple. But there was uh, some bad news, and that was that the Hasmoneans turned out to be, yes, very successful militarily, but very poor uh, politically. The kind of uh, administration they set up in Jerusalem uh, turned out to be riddled with problems, intrigues, uh, conflict, uh, all kinds of problems. And that's when some Jews pulled away from uh, Jerusalem, uh, believing that the temple and all of the hierarchy had become corrupt, so corrupt that only God could fix it, that the, the, there was no way for the Jews to internally fix their own problems. And that was where we find the um, emergence of uh, the scroll keepers, the scroll writers, and that uh, community known as Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the caves. That's the background. And that all took place in the uh, second and first century BC. Jesus was born at the end of that period um, and spent most of his life uh, in the first century BC. You'll remember his ministry is dated to around 30 AD when he was in his 30s. So she's talking about, Jody Magnus is talking about uh, that whole background and the, the emergence of the Pharisees, the Sadducees under the Hasmoneans and why there was this terrible conflict as to what was, what was tr true Judaism versus fake Judaism. Um, you also may recall when we were taught by uh, Rabbi Creditor, he talked about this very issue of how Judaism split in uh, first century BC and first century AD uh, into so many factions, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, etc. cetera. Um, that's very much part of the Jewish history um, as well as our, our history as Christians. I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, Jody also makes reference frequently to what's called second temple period. That is the reference to the period after the Babylonian exile when the Jews were allowed to return to their homeland and rebuild the temple. Uh, the Babylonians had destroyed uh, Solomon's temple, the first temple, and uh, eventually, uh, amazingly enough, the, when the Persians uh, took control of the Babylonians, the, the Persians allowed the Jews to go back home and start all over again building a temple. Now, the second temple was never as grand and as the first, but uh, it was still a pretty impressive edifice. And as we get close to the time of Jesus, which is to say the reign of Herod the Great, the man known as Herod the Great, um, he improved the, uh, the second temple considerably. He was, he was uh, obsessed with building uh, and, and, and the temple was one of his primary projects. He extended the, the acreage and did a lot of things. Anyway, so second temple period is the world of Jesus. Uh, I hope that helps a little bit. With Stuart, you've got like four minutes. Four minutes, okay. I don't know if anybody has any questions. As you noticed, uh, Jody was still struggling uh, or explained to us that the scholars today uh, wish we knew, wish they knew a lot more about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What she didn't mention, curiously enough, she told you about the priest Zadok uh, appointed by Solomon and what a rich tradition that the uh, Zadokites established in terms of uh, who was entitled to be a priest. Uh, but she didn't mention that the scroll keepers, the keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to themselves in the scrolls as the sons of Zadok. They were very much coming out of that tradition, which helps explain why they were so disillusioned with Jerusalem, 
which they which was not under the control of of uh, the Zadox anymore. So that explains that split. And Jesus, in turn, uh, as you remember, maybe um, very much had a lot in common with the scroll keepers. So to some extent, Jesus reflects the Z Z Zedekite tradition, uh, certainly not the Parasaic tradition, which helps explain why the par Pharisees uh, seem to be in conflict with Jesus so much in the, in the uh, New Testament. Any other questions or any questions? I'm just uh, trying to give you some background there. Okay, well, um, Jody Magnus has taught many courses uh, on the Bible and uh, some, some of them based on her archeological uh, work. She did a lot of work at Qumran with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, a lot of work. And many scholars will refer to her archeology span for example, for example, uh, uh, studies in the pottery, studies of the pottery that were found at Qumran, which tell us a lot about the people who live there, uh, just as an example of where her archaeology kicks in to her scholarship. Well, thank you again for your uh, patience during this closing session. Uh, I certainly uh, share with you uh, an awareness of how blessed we are in covenant class. We've had so many good speakers uh, thanks to uh, folks like uh, Mary D and Drake and uh, Wilson and others uh, who've, who've uh, arranged all these programs for us. So um, uh, we thank you for also uh, what's going on in the wider world. Uh, more of us are getting our vaccinations and it looks like maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel. So we look forward uh, to uh, next uh, fall and uh, wish you uh, a healthy and safe uh, summer. Thanks again. Great. Well, thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, really appreciate you closing us out for the spring season here. Classes will resume September 22nd in the fall, and we have a great lineup set for the fall. Um, look forward to, um, well, look for more emails from me over the summer regarding the lineup. And I know the church is working hard uh, the, the task force, the coronavirus task force is working hard to uh, ensure that we can be in person starting this fall in some form or fashion. And as Stuart said, hopefully with more and more people getting vaccinated, we'll be able to be fully in person uh, or hopefully that or some hybrid version. But it, it is my understanding that going forward uh, that classes will be available via Zoom whether we're in person or not. So we'll, we'll be coming to you via Zoom and in person in the fall, hopefully. So once again, thank you all for being such a great class and participating in all of our Zoom classes uh, since last fall. We really appreciate your, your staying engaged and participating. And as Stuart said, we, we hope everybody has a safe and healthy summer and look forward to um you know please look forward to more emails from me over the summer too as we get closer to the fall so thanks again everybody take care